These guys don't care, child, woman, baby, male, they don't care who. These guys don't have no remorse and no respect for nobody. They just shoot. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's pretty hectic in this area. These kids don't got no structure. They don't got no remorse for nothing they do. Hey, now look, E, public announcement. You better move off the fourth floor. Cause I'll be there every day, every day. You better go to your mama house. Huh? Y'all back door the wrong Welcome back to another episode of Swamp Stories. For this one, well, we cover a topic that you're probably tired of hearing about. Like damn, Oblock again? But I promise you, this video will introduce you to a new generation that you've never heard of before. However, in order for it all to make sense, we must cover a whole lot of background information. So in this video, you'll learn the history of Oblock, why they're so loyal to each other, and how the new generation has completely messed it up. With that being said, welcome to the new generation of Oblock. But before we get into it, let me run the intro. Chicago has always been a wicked and dangerous city, and most importantly with a huge underworld. Whether it was the Mafia, the Greaser Gangs, the Latin Kings, or today's GDs and BDs, through all of these eras there's always been one constant, the violence has never stopped. And because of this, hardworking families have been scrambling for decades to try to find a good neighborhood to live. So the families with good money either moved to the north side or to one of the various suburbs to get away. And that left many low-income families in truly dangerous and despair areas. Specifically, the south and west sides have become the worst parts of the city, averaging two to three homicides a day over the last 50 years. As a result, many of these families felt trapped in this environment and were looking for an affordable way out. So what was the solution to this problem? A wonderful new phenomenon called co-op housing. The co-op has opened its doors to everyone. Canada's first co-op apartment building. Because managing a co-op means new responsibilities. Here, instead of buying an apartment, you purchase the right to live in it by investing in the corporation. It's cheaper than buying a home, and it's a great way to find an upstanding community. Because there's a barrier to entry, it pretty much weeds out all of the gang members and unemployed individuals, and it creates a safe enclave in the middle of the hood. Well, one of these complexes was built on King Drive between 63rd and 66th, easily one of Southside Chicago's worst areas. The co-op was named the Parkway Gardens, and at the time, it was stated of the arc for middle class families. With 35 buildings and nearly 700 units, it quickly became a premier housing choice for African American families. When I was growing up, this was considered the elite property for doctors, lawyers, nurses, you know, professional people that lived over here. This was the cornerstone of our community. It's protected by train yards on the south and west sides, an elementary school to the north, and a major fence going down King Drive. So although it was in the hood, it was sheltered from the bad elements and the residents could live a peaceful life. This included the family of former First Lady Michelle Obama, for those who didn't know. While the glory days of Parkway Gardens lasted for a couple of decades with a strong middle class community. But then, sadly, the complex would start its gradual decline. In the mid-1980s, the owners of Parkway sold the complex to a new investor who decided to get rid of the co-op status. They replaced it with Section 8 renting and here is where the problems began. Throughout the 80s and 90s, the new owners neglected the property and started accepting new residents without background checks. And because of this, Chicago Kingpins began moving into the complex to operate their business. Specifically, a BD Kingpin named Tokyo G opened up in the complex and built a major operation. So major traffic was coming in and out of the Parkway Gardens on a daily basis, which caused other hoods to become jealous. Specifically, a territory across King Drive thought that he was taking up their business and they plotted on his head. This would be a reputed GD set called STL, long known for putting in work. Well, in September of 1998, Tokyo was tragically killed while rolling through their neighborhood. 
This is known to be the first official loss of Parkway as a collective, and from what we know, STL were the big bullies in the neighborhood and they simply eliminated Tokyo because he was taking their customers. In most of Chicago, this would start a major beef, but Parkway just really wasn't like that yet. These other hoods had major gangs that had been rocking together for decades, and Parkway really had nothing. They didn't have structure and there was no unity in order for them to fight off these other hoods. And as a result of all this, no one respected them in the streets, which will actually be important. Well, because of this lack of respect, many of the Parkway youth were tested and disrespected at school. This made it very important for them to stick together and to always have each other's backs against all odds. Since the very start, it was loyalty and brotherhood over everything, as it was the only way they could survive. Then out of nowhere, their challenges would become even more complicated. In 1998, Chicago began tearing down the majority of their public housing, and instead of rebuilding the projects, they decided to give all of the residents Section 8 vouchers where they could move into complexes like Parkway Gardens. And just like that, the Parkway Gardens filled up with project residents from all over the city. Obviously, with all the gang beef in Chicago, this made for a potentially dangerous situation. Rival gang members could now be neighbors, and not to mention that the original Parkway residents were entering the streets as well. The Parkway teenagers could potentially not like these other hoods moving into theirs, and maybe they'll want to send a message. Things could potentially get ugly, and there was only one way to keep the peace. The Parkway Gardens residents need to agree to unify as one, and to leave alone their past affiliations. So here's how it plays out. One particular Parkway native would step up to unify everyone who was moving in. This would be O.D. Perry, one of the most charismatic yet dangerous teenagers you'll ever meet. Tell me about O.D. Perry. This is your, your best friend. Force was like, Force was a gangster. He was, he was real savage. Like, Force was just like a young, young wild but he, he had heart. You know, he, he was fearless. He was like, he ain't had no fear. Ain't nothing he was really scared of. According to many, O.D. Perry was like the leader of the new generation of Parkway. That's like our big brother type shit, showing us the ropes as far as like small shit. Got a little money on them and shit, you know, like a few thousand, you know. Motherfuckers didn't have money back then. So we started doing the same thing. Same thing. O.D. Perry was a dangerous teenager, but instead of pushing people away, he wanted to unify Parkway as one. Essentially, him and his little homie T. Roy were the ones to welcome everyone in and have them all pushing Parkway. On top of this, O.D. was very advanced and he was known to put a lot of people from the younger generation onto his lifestyle. But on the flip side, if they ever had issues with people at school or on the streets, O.D. was always there to back them up. To him and T. Roy, they saw loyalty as the only way Parkway would ever survive the streets of Chicago. You must always have your brother's back right or wrong, and crossing them, hmm, you better not do it. Okay, so you might be sitting in your house in Santa Rosa, California, thinking, why would living in a specific apartment complex be this serious? Like, why do they all have to be unified, and who's even out there trying to harm them? So let me explain the dynamic. Right across King Drive, you have the reputed STL Gangster Disciples. For years, these were the bullies of the whole Woodlawn area, and they always took Parkway as a joke. But with this generation led by OD and Boss Top, the Parkway Gardens were not going to put up with this. So every single day in the mid-2000s, there were fights both at school and on the streets. It continued like this for a few years, and thankfully no one ever died. But then, O.D. Perry decides that it's time to go full-fledged on the rivals, no more fighting. He allegedly tells all of the younger homies like T-Roy that fighting is no longer allowed and it's time to start sparking sticks. He did this to prepare the youngins that the Parkway Gardens were now becoming implicated in a serious deadly beef. Specifically, the local gangs of STL, Jaro City, and 051 Young Money were clicked up against 600 and Front Street. And because Parkway had clicked up with the latter two hoods, they were becoming targets in the beef themselves. Yeah, things were about to get ugly, and OD wanted to make sure that his hood was ready for real beef. Cause once the beef crosses that line, everyone from Parkway will now be a target. Well, because of OD, the beef would definitely cross that line. On January 12th, 2011, Parkway claimed the life of 15-year-old Shondale Tuka Gregory at a bus stop on 63rd. From all accounts, Tuka wasn't even in the beef, he just so happened to hang out with the members in the neighborhood. He just wanted to do right to make me proud, that's all. Was he gang related? No. No. You don't think Tuka wasn't in the gang? No. 
The loss of Tuca devastated the 63rd community and especially his best friend, FBG Doug. And me and him clicked, like that was one of my real close friends. Like every day, like spend the night at his house, he spend the night at man. Duck was at home when he heard the shots and he went out running to see what happened. And that's when he saw his friend's last breath. You feel me? Then I ran all the way from 62nd and Wabash all the way to 63rd of St. Lawrence. Saved them right there on the float. After grieving this terrible loss, they now needed to know who did this. STL quickly found out that Odie Perry was the one responsible. I knew exactly who, who killed Took right away because it was so many people out that my walked up and only killed Took, only shot Took. He was at a bus stop. Yeah, he's at the bus stop. They on a bus stop six deep. He killed Tuka. Odie Perry was the shooter Fib. for Tuka. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Because of this horrible event, STL was ready to get revenge on Parkway. And because of this, the younger generation of Parkway was now forced to get violent as well. According to T-Roy, he was already ready to get stepping, but unexpectedly, one of his friends would as well. This would be a friend who had only moved into Parkway a year before this incident. This would be 15-year-old Devon Bennett, who was already a goon in his previous hood. But not only was he a goon, he was also charismatic and extremely handsome. Hmm. I'm just kidding. Well, as soon as he moved in, he was treated like family, with OD welcoming him and T-Roy becoming his best friend. Like, for whatever reason, him and T-Roy hit it off from the first day, so much so that Vaughn was willing to slide for him. And just like that, Parkway was developing their first official goon squad. They weren't even a gang, they were just guys who held loyalty and brotherhood over all else. They started calling themselves Wick City, Wick for wild insane crazy, and three eyes to show BD Alliance. Still though, after the death of Tuka, nobody respected them because they never had history of beef. But yeah, that was the name Wick City, and people used to make fun of uh make fun of us because like, you know, like uh, growing up on food stamps and stuff, you get called the Wick. Well, little did Southside Chicago know, the Parkway Gardens were filled with young and wicked goons. Obviously, they were led by OD and Boss Top, but the young guys were equally as wild. Miniature T-Roy and Super Handsome Vaughn were like beasts that were ready to be unleashed. All they needed was a reason to start stepping, and sadly, that reason would come. After the loss of Tuca, STL was determined to get revenge on OD. And that day would come. August 10th, 2011. It's shortly after midnight and OD Perry hops on his bike to head to the local store. As he exits the Parkway Garden gates, an SUV right there stops in its tracks. That's when two assailants hop out and run down on OD. Bam. This was a huge moment in Chicago history and the Parkway Gardens were absolutely shocked. OD was one of those staples in the community that you can never imagine losing. Cause he was like one of, the, one of our first ones that we lost. Like we weren't losing friends at the time or losing close ones at the time. So when we lost him, everybody felt it. Due to his significance, everyone decided to ditch the Wick City name and adopt Oblock in his commemoration. I remember uh, the day after OD died, man. And I was like, damn, I wonder what the hell we finna call a block now, cause, and then as soon as like, we came around, we all the way on the 60, uh, 65th end, and I saw that bitch right there spray painted on the garbage can, Oblock. I'm, ooh, I tell Dr. D, I'm like, I just thought of that shit. I'm like, I knew they was gonna call this bitch Oblock, like I knew he was gonna. The loss of OD brought everyone in Parkway even closer together than before. They were all there for this, and for whatever reason, it brought them an unexplicable bond. Nothing could ever separate or divide Oblock, as they were now all together in his commemoration. OD was big on everyone sticking together, so if we ever get in fights with our brothers, we're never taking it too far. Remember this this for later in the video. Well, after the loss of OD, T-Roy and Vaughn would go absolutely nuts for revenge. It was sad, man, and then T-Roy was like there with him his last little moments, and T-Roy, and, and then T-Roy said that, oh, was like, damn, they got me, bro. Like, that was his last words into that. So that shit changed, T-Roy. That shit changed, T-Roy, cause that shit happened, Troy and Vaughn, what the f jumped off head first, and when they did, they jumped off at a, at a higher level, more aggressive than the niggas who was around O was. T-Roy Vaughn and the rest of Parkway believed that it was a 14-year-old girl named Ja'Kyra Barnes who did this to OD. But not only this, her brother would insinuate it as well. She killed someone at 14 as revenge over Tuca. Man, OD got his shit splat. Odie Perry got killed at one point. I was gonna beat, 
But even after claiming the life of OD, the STL side was not done stepping. In fact, three more O Block members would lose their life in the coming months. Sure. And they're saying that the tone, Joey. So with all these O Block losses, Miniature T Roy and Handsome Vaughn were ready to start stepping. In fact, over the next year, the duo would go absolutely nuts. They would allegedly claim the lives of rival members Lil Doc, Dirty Rel, Model, P5, Boss Trell, Lil James, and Stunna. 2012 was a truly dangerous year to be a rival of Oblock. Then, in 2014, they would finally get real revenge for the loss of OD. On April 11th, 2014, Jakira K.I. Barnes was targeted in the heart of STL territory. I'm just gonna miss her presence. She was a very, very beautiful, well-known, like, lovely girl. 17-year-old Jakira Barnes loved basketball, her friends, and being with family. I love her, and I'm gonna fight for her to have justice because I don't think it's fair that we're losing our kids being gunned down every day in the streets. I wish I was laughing with my sister, for. I wish I was sending my sister this money. I wish I was sending my sister these pictures of me at these interviews on these platforms. I was, I was strong Kyrie's. Oh, too. That hurt my soul every day, every day, every day, every day. This was a massive loss for the STL side, and it marked that now the beef was way past any points of repair. Vaughn and T. Roy were their biggest targets, but for the meantime, they wouldn't be touchable. They both went to jail, and T. Roy also went on tour with his friend Chief Keith. Regardless though, T-Roy was bound to return to Chicago, and this is when Oblock would take their next massive loss. It's Valentine's Day where most couples are spending time with their lovers, and where single girls are taking pictures on Instagram with flowers that they bought themselves. But when you're Oblock's biggest stepper, there's no time for the lovey-dovey. At 11 in the morning, T-Roy notices that his op posted a picture on Instagram and he instantly knows the location. So right away, he hops on the bus and heads down to his op's location. When he gets there, he doesn't notice anyone outside, so he decides to walk block by block looking for his op. Little does he know an STL member happens to live in the area and spots him walking around. So the man whose name is FBG Brick calls a fellow STL member named TB and tells him what he saw. So instantly, TB and his friend allegedly head down to T-Roy's location. When they get there, they notice him walking into a convenience store, so they quietly follow him in. That's when they get up close to him, corner him in, and make a terrible decision. Bam. Everything froze for Oblock. It may be hard to understand, but T-Roy was like the most important member of the community. Not only was he an original Parkway resident, but he was also one of the first people to jump off the porch. Troy used to call me his son, man. When I first jumped off the porch, man, Troy used to... Troy was one of the... Man, like, Troy, he was... Look, evil, trying to teach me how to drill. Like, he trying to teach me how to how to drill, what to aim, what to, what to go for, what to, what the hit folks ass ended up telling. Like, yeah. From all accounts, after the loss of OD, T-Roy was the head honcho of O-Block. Not only was he sliding on rivals, he was also keeping O-Block united and checking any members who fell out of line. What about T-Roy, man? Was he oh, real? Yeah, that's, on a block, T-Roy was T-Roy. All the time. T. Roy, I definitely say was probably, he, he, he gotta take it bro, cause T. Roy was just, he was ruthless, he was ruthless. But T. Roy's loss affected no one more than his best friend Vaughn, who at the time was fighting a murder case and sitting in jail. Vaughn was devastated about the loss of his best friend and he urged the next generation of Oblock to step up and start sliding. This is how Get Back Gang formed, which is essentially the second generation of Oblock. A bunch of Oblockians who were never in the streets decided to step up and strap on their cleats. These included T-Roy's little brothers Heck and Zell Munna, who were never in the streets before. In fact, for their entire childhood, T-Roy sheltered them from the streets and made sure they would never be in this position. But after their big brothers lost, the formerly good kids would go on an absolute tear. Well, not only would the young guys step up, but the older generation of Oblock would as well. Essentially, every generation of Oblock united as one, all in the name of Get Back for T-Roy. While the rival hoods had internal affairs and backdoor activities, Oblock was solid as a rock. 
Get Back Gang would prove to be one of the most ruthless organizations in Chicago history. With so many members sliding at once, the rival side was taking losses left and right. Get Back Gang would claim the lives of Poppy, Kobe, FBG Brick, TB, Fradio, and Get Right. Now mind you, all of this happened just a year after T-Roy's loss. They obliterated the other side to the point where everyone assumed that STL was basically extinct. And because of all this destruction, the beef had no choice but to calm down. During this quiet period, King Von was actually able to beat his murder case and was released back onto the streets. This couldn't have been at a better time, because had he been released earlier, he may have thrown his life away getting back for T-Roy. But now that the streets were quiet, Vaughn was able to focus on his newly found love. Instead of chasing down ops, he was now chasing down studio time. That's when I'm with Dirk and he doing all this shit and shit. Ooh, that's when I'm like, I'm gonna rap. I'm gonna try to rap. It was just the point like, I'm on a block and I gotta study ass for money. I gotta, so now I need something to do. Yeah. What I'm gonna do. On May 27th, 2018, he released his first single, Beat That Body, which got him popping in the Chicago streets. Then, with Dirk's cosign and consistent success, his career took off in a major way. So with all this new fame and money, Vaughn decided to move to Atlanta where he could thrive and not think about ducking rivals. The future was looking bright for Vaughn and the rest of Oblock, but then everything would come crumbling down. On August 4th, 2020, six members of Get Back Gang would crash out in the dumbest way possible. Essentially, STL's biggest rapper FBG Duck is spotted at the mall by a man who doesn't like him. The man is upset that Duck is having relations with his girlfriend, and he wants to do something about it. But instead of confronting him himself, he decides to call up Duck's biggest ops. He calls up Get Back Gang and makes up a lie that Duck chased him through the mall with a So instantly, six Get Back Gang members hop in two cars and leave out of O-Block. They head directly to Duck's location, which happens to be the wealthiest mall in all of Illinois. They drive around until they spot him outside in line of the Dolce & Gabbana store. And that's when the members make their tragic decision. <laughs> this right here was the sloppiest drill that they had ever done. Not only did they do it in the richest part of Chicago, but they also never took the license plates off their cars. Because of this, they were all bound to get arrested. It was only a matter of time. This dumb decision would end up being the very end of Get Back Gang. Then, just a few months later, Oblock's leader would lose his life. On November 6, 2020, Vaughn would lose his life in Atlanta after a serious altercation. Have been following all morning long. Two men killed in an overnight shootout with Atlanta police and two groups of people. Joe Ripley has more as the GBI steps in to investigate. Atlanta police say two people are dead after an officer involved shooting here on Trinity Avenue in downtown. As dawn turned to daylight, you could make out dozens of evidence markers. GBI crime scene investigators combing the scene. Pretty active scene, pretty chaotic. Vaughn was truly the king of Oblock as he was the one who was keeping everyone together and also making sure that everyone was putting in work. On top of this, he was the bridge between the younger and older generations, making sure that respect was always intact. In Chicago, the young generations of hoods have been known to backdoor the OGs or anyone who they want. It's nothing like LA where there's structures and commands of respect, it's pretty much everyone is free for all. However, because of OD, T. Roy, and then King Vaughn, everything in Oblock was always intact. But now, you'll see what happens. While Get Back Gang was fading away, a new generation of Oblock was coming up out of nowhere. But this generation is rarely heard about, as many people believe that Oblock died when King Vaughn did. This couldn't be further from the truth, as Vaughn left them an awful legacy to look up to. As much as he was praised and idolized for what he did, you could only imagine that the misguided youth would try to imitate his life. But unlike Vaughn, this generation has no loyalty to those around them, and they'll even cross an OG if they want to. But first, let me introduce you to the next generation. We start out with a teenager named Jamon Brown, commonly known as Mun Amond. As a kid, Mon spent his whole childhood in Oblock witnessing all of the tragedies you've seen in this video. But despite this adversity, Mon had a good head on his shoulders and was able to do well in school through all the chaos. I mean, he even played on his high school soccer team. So while his friends were already in the streets, he was mainly focused on college and his financial future. Well, his determination would pay off as he was accepted to Western Illinois University where he enrolled as a freshman. Life was looking like a success story for Jamon, but after a few months in college, things would take a sharp left turn. 
On November 20th, 2019, Jaman was having mental outbursts in his dorm, prompting other students to call security. So security comes and they notice that he's acting erratic and uncontrollable. He won't answer questions or sit down, so they decide to call an ambulance to transport him to the hospital. There, Jamond is visited by a psychologist who tries to make attempts to understand what's going on. Typically, college students can have breakdowns due to stress or social pressure, but this case was a little bit different. Jamond had witnessed so much trauma in his life and much of it was boiling up inside without any help. Well, because of the severity of his mental state, the psychologist asks him to stay in the hospital until he fully calms down. But Jamond understandably doesn't want to be there, so he decides to head back to campus against the hospital's wishes. Well, little does he know, his university banned him from ever returning to the dorms. So as soon as he enters the building, he's noticed by security who decides to call 911. So police instantly come to his dorm and arrest him for trespassing. But Jamond resists the arrest and won't comply, prompting the officers to take him to jail. This is truly sad because Jamon needed help from the university and the system not to be trespassed and arrested. Like how does this possibly help in the situation? Now you're going to turn a kid who's seeking mental health into a criminal? Well sadly, the situation would get even worse. During the ride to jail, Jamond has another outburst where he kicks the door and says that he's going to blow things up. Motherfuckers can't even go to school without y'all harassing people like what the f***? Y'all don't get sick of harassing people, bro? Y'all don't even know what the wrong, bro. Y'all just can't get no peace, bro. You'll get arrested for nothing, nothing, nothing. This makes no f***ing sense. Like, no sense, bro. No sense. I promise to God I will blow this up. I swear to God I will. I swear to God I will. I don't give a f*** about a felony. I don't give a f***. I come from felonies. I come from felonies. Now Jamond was in serious trouble, facing multiple charges and being expelled from school. But thankfully he was blessed with a forgiving judge and eventually his charges would be dropped. Sadly though, he now had to return to Oblock where his surroundings instantly got worse. Trust me, the Parkway Gardens is no place for anyone dealing with mental health. And on top of this, his return home would be at the worst time possible as it was right at the start of a new generation of Oblock vs Taekwon World Beef. While Jamond was off in college, his friends were jumping off the porch on the rivals. And on that note, let me introduce you to the new generation of Oblock. First you have Jamond's best friend named Lil Mike, a young dude who's known for being reckless in the streets. Then you have Taekwon Manny, also known as TQ, a 17 year old known for getting money. Next you have his older brother DQ, who's on the same hype but he's also trying to be the next King Vaughn. And finally you have the young guys Jado, Nuwop, and the youngest Tai Mana. So directly after Mon's return from college, this is exactly who he was hanging with. And just two weeks after his return, things would get tragic for the first time in this generation. That takes us to December 8th, 2019. It's a Monday afternoon in Oblock and TQ gets ready to do business in another hood. Specifically, he heads 15 minutes down the road to a hood called Fintown. Fintown has nothing to do with Oblock, so TQ figures that everything is straight. So he arrives in their hood and waits on 87th in order to make a deal that he set up online. He waits and waits and waits, but suspiciously nobody shows up. Then after 10 minutes of waiting, a man in a mask approaches him quickly. And sadly, the man makes a tragic decision. Everyone was devastated, but also puzzled about the situation. Who could have done this to TQ, and why did they set him up? At first, it didn't make any sense, but then the Oblockians started putting two and two together. And it all centered around an alleged Fintown member named BCR Measle. Why? Well, because he happens to be the first cousin of FBG Duck. Now of course, this is just speculation, but later in the video it will make sense. So remember the name, BCR Measle. Well regardless, this is when the new generation of Oblock decided to step up. This includes Munamond and of course all of the other members I mentioned. But before there was get back, sadly they would lose another friend. Two months later, February 8th, 2020, 2.30 p.m. Jado gets a text from his friend De Niro asking him to come over and make a deal. So Jado instantly gets ready so that he can head over there. But as soon as he departs from Oblock, a man is following him. He catches up to Jado and doesn't say a word. Instead, he makes a terrible decision. 
Jado was like the O.D. Perry or the T-Roy of the new generation. He was charismatic, he brought everyone together, but he was also nothing to play with. Uh, he was like, like, like our age group, like the new generation from our block, he was like, he was the leader. I'm gonna say, yeah, he's like the brain. Like one of the smartest one out of all us. Yeah, like folks, yeah. Folks was like the brain and the muscle. Yeah. Like he was the he was the mastermind after all this shit. Well, because he was so important to Oblock, the young generation started calling themselves the Jado Jumpouts. Now everyone was on board to get revenge for Jado, but there was one question: Who did this, and did De Niro set him up? Well, right after the news broke, De Niro posted a screenshot of his last conversation with Jado, pretty much saying that he wishes he never texted him because that way he would have never come outside. So now that De Niro was in the clear, who could it have possibly been? Well, the rival Taekwon World side started celebrating, which pretty much revealed itself. Specifically, a Taekwon World member named D Money would go on live and troll Jado. Look, Jado got his ass smoke. And we still spinning like five cars deep, no doubt. This would not end well for D Money. May 15th, 2020. It's a nice warm evening in Southside Chicago, and D Money is outside walking his dog. As he's casually walking around his neighborhood, a car creeps up on him. That's when a man hops out of the passenger seat and runs all the way up to him. And before D-Money can even react, the man makes a terrible decision. <laughs> and just like that, another generation of Taekwon World vs. O-Block beef was stamped. It's the same exact way that T-Roy and Vaughn went on a tear for OD, and then how Get Back Gang went on a tear for T-Roy. If one thing is for certain, it's that starting a beef with O-Block is never a good idea. Once you poke the bear, they just never stop coming, and there's no timeline on revenge. And that fast forwards us a year to February 8th, 2021. In Chicago, trying to throw parties or just having fun with your friends is never an easy task. You never know if your ops are going to show up to the party or if a simple argument will turn deadly. So because of this, many people from the hood in Chicago will head out to other cities to have some fun in peace. Sometimes they'll go up to Milwaukee, out to Iowa City, or potentially down to Indianapolis. But for FBG, they tend to stay closer to home in the tucked off suburb of Bloomingdale, Illinois. In particular, they rent out a couple rooms at the Indian Lakes Hotel where they can have some peaceful fun. Well, on this particular Friday night, the word gets out and over 200 people show up to the hotel. This includes FBG Duck's cousin Measle, who Oblock believe claims the life of TQ. Because of this, Measle happens to be one of the most wanted men in Southside Chicago. But on this night, he figures no one will find him and he can sit back and have some good old fun. The party is jumping, girls are twerking everywhere, and everything is going well for over an hour. It gets to the point where the whole 6th floor hallway is flooded with people and it's a party like you've never seen before. Well at 2am, a couple of men in masks wiggle through the hallways looking for Measle. They then push their way into the party where they see him. Sadly, they make a tragic decision. Bang. That's right, right now police still here on scene of the hotel serving search warrants looking for evidence like weapons linked to this investigation. Police tell me this isn't the first time they've been called to the hotel. It was the sound of gunfire coming from the Indian Lakes Hotel around 2.30 this morning that prompted this massive police response. It is response to Indian Lakes Resort for the shots fired report, 250 West Chick. What police say started as a large hotel party with nearly 200 people ended in gunfire and a Chicago man is dead. Unfortunately, there may have been more because over 100 people fled the hotel before we had contact with them. The victim identified as 27-year-old James McGill. McGill lived in the city's Inglewood neighborhood. Police say they've been called out to the hotel for drug and gun cases in the past, even writing a letter to hotel management, asking them to address these issues. Lighting, security, additional staff, management on duty, so we've conveyed to them that we had concerns back then and we almost predicted that something could happen there. During the party, which spanned two floors, investigators say only one employee was working and no security on scene. Well, because of this incident, the owners of the Indian Lakes Hotel were forced to shut down their business. So not only did May 15th claim a life, but it also claimed a major business for a family. New at 10, the Indian Lakes Hotel in West Suburban Bloomingdale will shutter for good after a deadly shooting there last month. Today, the hotel's owner, First Hospitality Group, agreed to surrender its business license and end all business on the property. 
Bloomingdale village leader said the hotel had been a trouble spot for years. Well, even though there were 200 people at the party, zero people came forward with evidence. So of course, we don't officially know who did this, but an O-Block member would post something on his story. The day after the incident, he would post a picture with a cutout of TQ and he'd say, and now his killer is dead. On top of this, just the next day, a whole crew of Oblockians would seemingly celebrate the loss. The new generation of Oblock was doing the same exact things as the past. But thankfully, to this point, Oblock was still unified as one, even after the loss of all their leaders. But then the Jado jumpouts would ruin all of that for the first time ever. These guys would instantly become more reckless than any generations of the past. So here's how it goes. The story goes that Munamond made the reckless decision to rob an OG O-Block member for 15000 In the history of O-Block, this has never been okay, and OD, T-Roy, and Vaughn would definitely not allow this. Especially because the alleged victim was one of T-Roy and Vaughn's closest friends. But for the young generation like Munamond, they had no respect for the elders and would literally cross anyone for money. Well, because of these reckless actions, an original O-Block member named A-Roy would call for the DP of Munamond. A-Roy was a respected and active member since back in the day, as you can even see him in vlogs from around 2012. So because of his seniority in the hood, he had every right to discipline Munamond. That takes us to December 15th, 2021. It's a regular day in Oblock and all of the younger generation are hanging out inside the gates like any other day. This includes Munamond who's chilling like he has nothing to worry about. He knows the older generation had warned him about what they're gonna do, but he simply just doesn't care. Well, Aroy was not just talking as here he comes ready to fight Munamond. So he walks up to him in front of the whole neighborhood and boom, he starts whooping him. Everyone in the neighborhood is watching, and there's even girls on the top floor recording it. Then when Aroy lets up on him, a tragedy strikes. Bang. A shot goes off, and Aroy is rushed to the hospital. Sadly though, he wouldn't make it after surgery. Aroy had survived all those years in the streets just to lose his life like this. He was a valuable and well-respected member of the community, and because of this, the older generation was pissed. Nothing like this had ever happened in Oblock, and something needed to be done. So in order to keep the internal peace, the older generation decided to collectively ban Munamon from Oblock. You messed up and took things too far. We don't want to hurt you, but please never come back around. Now the ball is in Mon's court. Do you want to listen to the OGs, or disrespect their wishes and do what you want? For the first solution, you have to swallow your pride, but everything will be peaceful. But for the second solution, well things could get ugly. Well, here's the problem. This is not the O-Block of the old days. The older generation have no say-so, and on top of this, they're way outnumbered. So Munamon completely disregards his ban, and the Jado jumpouts are right beside him. The original members cannot believe it, so here's what they do. First, Aroy's brother named Big P posts on Instagram that everyone in O-Block better pick a side. Y'all better pick a side on Molly, I'm not playing. Quit playing with me, you little ass boy, stay in y'all place. He then goes on live and explains why he feels the way he feels. But it took them to kill my brother, turn my savage up. That's why y'all ain't kill me, y'all kill my little brother. Now his daughter very mad, and that angers me, and it pissed me off when she asked where her daddy is. I can't believe old block, man. I put my heart and soul in this block. I can't believe old block, man. I put my heart and soul in this block. Then Munamon takes to Facebook and responds in the most disrespectful way possible. Letting your brother die in front of you and you don't do that just makes you a bitch even more. Telling that to a man who just lost his brother is beyond me. But like I've said, the young generation of Oblock has zero respect for their elders. Well, as you would expect, Big P takes this to heart and decides to threaten all of the Jado jumpouts. Hey, Ebo, you down. Moon, you down. Lil Mike, you down. D-Lo, you Yeah, Mom first, definitely first. No, I'm like that. Hey, child, I know Mom low. We're going to get over him anyway. We're going to feed him a sandwich before we kill him. Better move that crib. Think I'm, think I'm gonna let that little bitch slide? Nigga, better move that crib. Well, for whatever reason, Munamon takes this all as a joke and he responds on Instagram Live. What's that, nobody? <laughs> he, he ducking his dancer. He ain't a threat. I'm fooling him, he ain't no threat. Stop trying to make it seem like he a threat. He a goofy for the internet. <laughs> they be thinking <laughs> threats. Hey, he ain't yeah. no 
threat, man. <laughs> Stop making it say like he a threat. It's goofy on full of grade. Trolls be wolfing all day. Nobody. I know ain't nobody gonna do They can fool y'all with this internet. They ain't fooling me. Hey, get that Jado dropout, boys. Jado dropouts. That's it for life. I take that shit to the grave. That was my boy on Fulham Gray. After this, Big P and the jump outs would go back and forth online for plenty of days. But sadly, this is not LA where they talk about each other and that's all that happens. This is Chicago where it always turns up badly. The rest of 2022 would be a bad year for Big P. According to him, the jump outs lit up Oblock and hit him in the face. Thankfully though, the injuries were minor and he would be okay. They can't believe I'm still alive. I'm still alive, show. My leg hurt. Hey, y'all was the ball. He had the gun like this. He didn't even want to shoot. He shot me in my head. That boy was running so slow. Regardless, this is the moment where everyone realized that the internal beef is something serious. Then, just a couple weeks later, Big P's car and his dad's house are both lit up. Thankfully, no one was injured, but his car was totaled. Yeah, things were looking bad for Big P, and on top of this, not too long after, he would be arrested for a gun charge. But you know what? This may have been a good thing, because now he was away from the Jado jumpouts. But not for long. On November 20th, 2022, Munamon would be arrested for lighting up Big P's dad's house and his car. So now, Big P and Munamon were together in the Cook County Jail. Well, that's awkward. But in typical Chicago fashion, Munamon's charges would be dropped and he was right back on the streets. After returning to Chicago, he would start his career as a drill rapper, and honestly, I don't know why he isn't famous. Well, you guys can check out his music for yourself, and let me know if it's any good. Well, Munamon started gaining popularity, and here is where things get really complicated. For whatever reason, a bunch of original Oblock members like Edog are showing support in the comments. As you would imagine, Big P is pissed. He's literally been betrayed by everyone. The youngins eliminated his brother, and now all of his day one homies are taking their side. You can only imagine how he may feel. Yeah, I made Edog last video. That's the last video we shot. I ain't getting no more videos. That he can't rap. I hate his music. He sounds like he got spit in his mouth or something. Hey E, when you went to go blow a 50, bro? You don't even own a 50, you got a little ass. Well, according to rumors, the Oblock split is much more complicated than the older versus younger generation. From what we know, in the summer of 2022, Big P was not only beefing with the Jado jumpouts, but he was also beefing with his former friends. So let me break it down. The FBG Duck murder case was a pivotal moment for Oblock. A bunch of members accused other members of snitching and it caused a whole bunch of nonsense. Well, Big P was one of these as he called out Boss Top for snitching. If you're unfamiliar, Boss Top is one of the original Oblock residents and was best friends with O.D. Perry and T-Roy. So calling him out for snitching without any paperwork and doing it on live? I don't know about this one. But he claims to have information that Boss Top snitched on one of the defendants named C. Murda. Better go check top name, Tyree Dave. He, he telling on C. Murda. Go, go find that out. He then threatens him. I'm killing your ass and more and look Mike D. <laughs> e. Boss Top, all you down. This is clearly a man who's distressed after what happened to his brother and he's understandably upset. Everyone turned on him and was in the wrong and now he's crashing out. But now here's the big question, is Big P actually with the action, or is he all talk? Well, we don't exactly know, but something would happen to Boss Top. By this time, Boss Top had moved to Atlanta, so he probably wasn't thinking about Big P's threats. However, he would return to Oblock for a special occasion. It's July 4th and everyone gathers together in Oblock. Music is blasting and everyone is letting off fireworks for fun. This includes Boss Top who's just happy to be in his neighborhood and enjoying fun with his friends. Then out of nowhere, somebody rolls through. <laughs> he was hit, but thankfully he was okay. What the f happened? You're just walking around. Like, we're, we're talking about how Oblock's so nice, but you got shot right over there, right? I mean, I just know I was on Instagram. I was finna go live and I just felt some you were f about to go live. Yeah, and I just felt something. Out on the on the street? Not in the actual complex? I just felt something, Adam. That's it. Right. I just felt something. Where? In my back and then my arm. It came out my side right here, side of my chest. You had to go to the hospital? No, I went to the vet. <laughs> no, I had to go to the damn hospital. I don't wanna fuck. <laughs> we ain't got back. no bootleg, doctors. <laughs> 
So obviously Boss Top is in good spirits, and he's an example that if you have old beef, please get out of your city. We don't know exactly who did this, but all of this internal conflict is definitely sad. If OD Perry, T-Roy, or Vaughn saw what was happening today, they would lose their minds. Oblock has completely fallen apart and the majority of their beef is internal. On top of this, the younger generation has ruined some relationships with Oblock's former allies. So here's what happened. Oblock always had a solid relationship with a hood called NLMB. If you're unfamiliar, their territory is in the South Shore neighborhood and they also go by EBK. Well, for whatever reason, the young generation of Oblock would get into it with them. Sadly, this would claim the life of a young success story in the hood. A junior student at Northern Illinois University would lose his life while leaving his sister's house. Elijah just so happened to be the younger brother of EBK Juvie, one of the most controversial figures in Chicago streets. Through all of the chaos growing up, Elijah was able to stay focused in school and make his dreams come true. Because of this, his loss was incredibly devastating to the community. Well, according to the internet, a 16-year-old Jado Jumpout was arrested for it. And they're saying it's the same person who Steven Jackson came and checked in with. How they coming? We're in the middle of it. Y'all pull up and take pictures and y'all not allowed to. <laughs> and one thing about it, if you're a real one, you don't mind checking in. Checking in. What'd you say? I check it, I check in with the real one. That's why I'm in that's why I'm in the middle of old block. Where you at? You see the hoop? Where you at? I'm in the middle of old block. Uh, yeah. Listen, man. But on a serious note, we can only hope that the beef in Oblock will stop. After all of these generations of beef, absolutely nothing has come from it but devastation. On top of this, you're beefing over a block that you don't even own. How silly is that? The craziest part is that Oblock is literally about to get demolished. Well, all we can do is hope that the future of Chicago gets better from here. Because honestly, no child in the world deserves to be raised in this environment. Well that's going to do it for this episode of Swamp Stories. If you enjoyed the video, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe. Peace!